Welcome to The Good News is Better Than You Think, Chapter 3, The Two Adams. The Apostle Paul often uses a phrase which we sometimes bypass as insignificant or have difficulty in understanding. It is a phrase, in Christ. This phrase appears several times in the writings of Paul, and it is full of deep significance. It is most often found in the books of Ephesians and Colossians. What does this phrase mean, and how important is it that we should understand it? Ephesians 1 verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. God has already blessed us with all spiritual blessings, but there is a qualification. Where are these blessings? They are in Christ. There is only one way to obtain these blessings. We have to be where they are. Ephesians 2 verse 6 says, And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2 verse 6. Notice how strong Paul's statement is. He says we are actually sitting in heavenly places. We look at ourselves and say, It is not true. I'm sitting here on earth reading this book. So what does Paul mean? He is emphasizing the fact that the Christian's life is united with the life of Christ. The same life which is in my toes is also in my finger. So, wherever my toes go, the life in my fingers also goes there. That is what Paul is trying to say. He is saying, if Christ is your life, wherever Christ is, that is where you are. In 1 Corinthians 15 verse 45, we have an interesting statement. And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last, Adam, was made a quickening spirit. 1 Corinthians 15 45 In order to correctly understand what it means to be in Christ, we first need to understand what it means to be in Adam. Notice the verse speaks of two Adams. There is a first Adam and there is a last Adam. The last Adam, of course, refers to Jesus Christ. But the question is, why is Jesus called the last Adam? Now we know Adam was the first man. He was placed in a garden and he was given a beautiful wife. None of these things applied to Jesus, yet he is called the last Adam. God is trying to say something to us. When we look at Adam, we can learn something about him that helps us to understand something about Christ. In Romans 5 verse 14, Paul says, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Romans 5 verse 14. Here it says, Adam was a figure of Christ. There is some way in which Adam and Christ are similar. Romans 5 verse 19 gives us the key to understanding why Jesus is referred to as the last Adam. It says, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Romans 5 verse 19. Look at the verse again. It says, By one man's disobedience many were made sinners. But a little word was left out when the translators of the King James Version translated this verse. In actual fact, the verse should read, By one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. This is the way it is translated in several versions of the Bible. The verse is not just saying that some became sinners. It is comparing two sets of people. On one side there is the one, and on the other side there are the many. Who is the one? The one is Adam. And who are the many? The many are all the rest of humanity. When one man disobeyed, what happened to the many? They became sinners. It was not their own actions or behavior which made them become sinners. No, it was one man's disobedience that caused the many to become sinners. Of course, that doesn't seem to be fair or just. But it is not an issue of justice. This is the way the law of consequence works in the universe. One man's choice affected all his descendants. All were born into Adam's sin. When you and I were born, it was not our fault that we were sinners. But the problem of sin has been passed on to us, and we have to deal with it. 
If a child is born with AIDS, it cannot be his fault. It has to be his parents' fault. It is not a question of who is to blame, but it is still the reality which that child has to live with. God created one man, and when he created this one man, all human life was in that person. God did not create every person individually. Instead, he created one human life, and the life of all humans was created in that one life. It is that same life which has been multiplied and passed on over the centuries. We are all partakers of Adam's life, and in this sense, we are all in Adam. In other words, since we are all partakers of that life, then we are all a part of Adam's existence. But if we are all a part of Adam's life, what kind of life do we expect to have? If something is born from a goat, would we expect it to be a cat? Adam could only beget in his own image. Although he was originally made in the image of God, he perverted that image, and this perverted image is the only thing that he could pass on to his children. Because of Adam's sin, we are now the lawful prey of Satan. We have no right to be born with the life of God anymore, so we are all born without God's Spirit. This is the heritage that we have received from Adam, and it is important for us to understand this. The reason why humanity, in its natural state, does evil is not because men don't try to do good. It is just simply that men are living the reality of Adam's life. The life in us is a corrupted life, and it is not possible for us to live any other life than the one which we have. It is in this sense that, as the Bible says, we are made sinners by what Adam did. It does not mean that we are made guilty by another man's sins. What it means is that we are born sinful and helpless, unable to do anything good. We were born a kind of being, sinner. Many years ago, I attended a graduation service. The speaker kept saying, You are becoming what you are. As I listened, I thought, What is this guy talking about? How can you become what you already are? At the time, it did not make sense to me, but now, as I have come to understand the truth of the two Adams, I realize that there is truth in what the speaker was saying. If we all inherited Adam's corrupt, incapable life, then the fact becomes inescapable. As long as all we have is the life of Adam, as long as we are in Adam, then the longer we live, the more effort we make, all we can do is manifest more fully the life which we already possess. We can only become what we already are. Nothing man can do or has ever done has ever been able to change human nature. Man's efforts have never produced new life. Acts 17 verse 26 says, And God hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Acts 17 Verse 26. We can see how perfectly true it is. It is not only spiritually, but also physically that we are brothers and sisters. If we can go back far enough in time, we would find that all of us have the same grandparents. But in spite of this family kinship, we often fight against each other because that is the nature of Adam's life. There is no peace in that life, no harmony. Like a cancer in the body, Adam's life fights against itself. I once saw a video of a dog chewing a bone whose behavior seemed to be crazy. As this dog was eating the bone, his hind leg started to move towards his mouth as though it had a mind of its own. The dog began to growl at his own foot, but as the foot moved closer to the bone, he turned around and started to bite his own foot. It happened over and over. I looked at this dog and I thought, that is just like the behavior of the human race. The thing is, we can tell that the behavior of this dog is crazy, but often mankind does not realize that this is exactly how those who possess the life of Adam behave, fighting against their own life. This is the natural behavior of the fallen life of Adam. The main point is this. Why are we the way we are? Is it because we try to be this way? The answer is no. It is not because of our efforts or even because of our choice. It is because we were born this way. One man did it to all of us. We are condemned to commit sin because we are the descendants of Adam 
and this condemnation rests upon the entire human race because of one man. What do we have to do to be condemned? We only have to be born. When I say condemnation, I don't mean that God condemns us. I don't mean that we are guilty of what Adam did. In order for a person to be guilty, he has to make a choice to break a known law. God does not condemn us for what somebody else did, but our condition condemns us. The child born with AIDS is condemned to die. The disease in the child condemns the child. In the same way, our condition condemns us. This is what the Bible means when it says, By the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Romans 5 verse 18 In this state, it is impossible for us to live a righteous life, and sooner or later, unless something happens to give us a new life, we will die in this lost condition. It is a life which we possess which condemns us. If God's grace in Christ had not intervened, the very moment that Adam chose to eat the fruit, he would have dropped dead. When the life of God was removed spiritually, physical life would have ended immediately and the entire human race would have died in Adam. But Jesus stepped in between mankind and eternal death. He took the curse upon himself and he obtained a period of probation for all of us. By his sacrifice he said, Though they are spiritually dead, preserve their physical life for a time and give them a chance to find their way back to spiritual life. This is why God has given us time, 70 or 80 years usually, to live. Our days on earth are a chance to find our way back to life through Christ because we were all born dead. It is interesting to notice that God never promised to repair Adam's life. The Christian life is not a remodeled life. The Bible makes it plain that the life of Adam has to die. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 Having been born in Adam, our greatest need is to have a new life. The old one is condemned and cannot be repaired. It has to die. But where are we to get this new life? In order for life to be passed on, there has to be an original source of life. Adam was the source from which all human life was passed on, but his life became corrupted unto death. Now that we need a new life, what does God give us? He gives us a second Adam. He gives us somebody else who is the source of a new life. If we can understand this, we can know why Jesus is called the last Adam. Not because he was put in a garden with a beautiful woman, but because he is the source of a new life. He is the father of a new race of people. Only by birth. Now, as we consider what it means to be in Christ, there is another principle that we need to understand. Life is passed on from one person to the other by birth and only by birth. The only person who has ever been an exception to this rule is Eve, because she was not born. She received her life through Adam's rib. In Isaiah 9 verse 6, Jesus is called the Everlasting Father. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9 verse 6 Jesus is not the Father in the Godhead. He is the Son of the Father. But this concept of the two Adams makes it clear what the true meaning of this verse is. Jesus is the Everlasting Father. But of whom? He is the Father of all who make up the new creation, the new human race. Jesus is the second Adam, and from him there comes a new race of people who have been born into his life. In this sense, he is their father, the last Adam. Let us consider what this means. There is a parallel between both Adams. One brought us into sin, one brings us into righteousness. When Adam took the forbidden fruit, none of us was yet born, so we had no consciousness. But our life was there. And when 
Thousands of years later, we were born. Naturally, we began to live the fallen life of Adam. Did we have any choice? No, we simply obeyed what our natures demanded that we should do. Now consider the second Adam. Does his life work in the same way? If you are born into the second Adam, what is it that now determines how you live? It is his life. It is not your effort. Your effort was not what determined how you lived when you were in the first Adam. It was nature working its course which made you what you were. Likewise, when we are a part of the second Adam, our effort does not produce the life we live. Our behavior is the natural result of our new reborn nature taking its course. The Life in Christ All the qualities that Jesus possesses are a part of his life. There is no sin and there is no condemnation in him. This life is in Christ, on the right hand of God, the place of infinite power and privilege, far above all principalities and powers. These are the qualities which are an intrinsic part of this life of Christ. We don't need to struggle to obtain these wonderful things. They are already ours, present in Christ. The one question is, whose life do you have? That is the only question. Our deliverance and victory does not depend on what we have done, but on whose life we have inherited. Notice that what Adam did was done before anybody was born. Likewise, what Christ did was done before we were born. But when we were born into Adam, the behavior which appeared in our lives was simply a manifestation of the nature that Adam had received from his transgression thousands of years ago. In the same way, when we are born into Christ, what appears in our lives is simply a manifestation of what Christ already did 2,000 years ago. So Paul could say, I am crucified with Christ, and every Christian can say the same thing. If you ask me, when were you crucified? When did your old life of Adam die? I will say 2,000 years ago, for the life that I possess was crucified 2,000 years ago. If you ask me, what is your relationship to God? I will say, we are one. The life I possess is one with God's life, for the life which I possess is the life of Christ himself. When I came to God, recognizing myself as a son of Adam, my question was, who am I to approach God? No matter how I tried, it was hard to believe that I was heard. Because I was so unworthy, I could hardly ever believe that I could get an answer. But when Jesus prays, his prayer is perfectly acceptable. There is no obstacle standing in the way of God's answering his prayers. There is great power in prayer when we pray in Christ. There is no difference in how God deals with us and how he deals with Christ because we share the same life. We are truly one. It is something wonderful to think about. It is even more wonderful to believe. So in these two Adams, the lives we live were already determined even before we were born. This is why the Bible tells us that one man made us all sinners. Romans 5 verse 19. As soon as we were born, we began to live like sinners because this is what we already were. We could not help ourselves. Now, on the other side, in order to experience the life of Christ, we have to be born again. How do we become born again? On the side of the first Adam, our life is passed on by means of a sexual relationship. But how is life passed on from the second Adam? It is by faith. It is through the Holy Spirit that Christ's life is passed on. Our involvement is that we believe God. So even though Christ has done all of this, if we are to experience it, we do need to be born again. And faith takes us into that experience. Adam accomplished condemnation for all men. He did it for us all. But nobody will experience it unless he is born. In the same way, although Jesus accomplished deliverance for us all, no one will experience it unless he is born again into Christ. So Jesus said, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, 
but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. John 3, 17 and 18 What do we have to do to be condemned? Nothing. We just have to remain the way we are. We are born in unbelief. All we have to do is just continue to not believe, and we will continue in that condemnation where Adam had already put all mankind. We are not standing here in the world in a neutral position, free to choose between two sides. Some have the idea that we are in a kind of in-between ground and that we can freely choose one side or the other. This idea is a false one. This may have been true of Adam, but we are not standing in his place. We are born and live our lives already on Satan's side. Our only choice is to escape from that side, and the only way to escape is to receive the life of Christ. If we don't believe, we remain in our condemnation. But if we believe, our faith takes hold of the life of Christ, and we escape the condemned life. The gospel is really very simple. In essence, it is this. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Galatians 3 verse 8 The gospel was preached to Abraham. And what was this gospel? Look at what it says. In one man all the world is blessed. That is the gospel. Our lives, our blessing, everything is in one person, in Christ. When I read the Bible, I realize that in a sense, God is only going to save one man. All of us will partake of that salvation, but God's plan was to save us all as a part of one person. There is one righteous man, one who deserves God's favor, one who conquered sin. Our only hope is to join up to that life. And this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. 1 John 5, verse 11.